Grandpa Jack. Tuning in. Wait, why are you at ECMC? How's everybody else doing? Oh, for sure. Thank you for stopping in. Grandpa Jack, you are always welcome. Miracle, you're doing good. You have some uh, turkey for your Thanksgiving. Some mashed potatoes, perhaps. Hmm? Time well spent with family, says Jordy. Hey, that sounds perfect. Too much turkey, to be honest. I don't know what that means, Miracle. I thought Thanksgiving was about too much turkey. <laughs> yeah, we still have leftovers at my house, too. of good leftovers for Thanksgiving. Listen up, everybody. We're going to talk about a pitch displacement autopilot today. And I'm going to bounce back in between writing these notes and doing some simulation in MATLAB. So please, if you can, get MATLAB open at the same time as you watch. You can follow along, you'll learn some commands that'll help you with this homework. It'll help you with our last homework. So we have this homework due Friday, right? And then we just have one more homework. So you guys are very close to the end. 
and um, basically we're just reviewing or, or not reviewing we're we're introducing some control systems principles and we have a very short amount of time to cover some control so you're just getting a taste this is kind of like a survey and if you're interested in more control systems we have plenty of control systems classes you can take if you have space in the spring I'm teaching digital controls so if you're if you're into control systems definitely think about checking that out okay let's get into it whoops I think I lost a little connection there all right so a pitch displacement autopilot actuates control surfaces of an aircraft to make the pitch angle approach a desired pitch angle and in controls we'll call any desired dynamics the reference dynamics so our desired pitch angle is the reference pitch angle theta so this is just the angle that the nose of the aircraft is pitched up relative to a flat earth. So we're going to design a specific type of pitch displacement autopilot that uses purely elevator deflection to achieve pitch control. Often pitch control or altitude control is accomplished with a combination of the elevator and the thrust changing speed of the aircraft but we're we're going to assume that the speed of the aircraft is constant and we're just going to use the elevator to do pitch control so let's whenever you do control you you start with a, a model for the dynamics of the system and the model that we're going to use boom this second order transfer function this is what we're going to start with this transfer function comes from our short period approximation of the um, longitudinal dynamics of an aircraft. So this transfer function relates a change in the pitch rate of the aircraft to a change in the elevator angle. And I've been using this kind of transfer function notation here where this capital G indicates a transfer function and the superscript indicates the output of the transfer function and the subscript indicates the input. So the input is the elevator, the output is the pitch rate. So um, we're going to talk about the pitch angle here and I think I showed this derivation last time but we'll just quickly show this as well. So the pitch angle is related to the pitch rate in this way. So for level flight, non-turning flight, the pitch rate is the time derivative of the pitch angle. So let's take the Laplace transform of this because we need to bring everything into the Laplace domain. And that's just going to give us Q of S is equal to S. Wait, I should put a delta here. Delta theta of S. So using this, our transfer function that relates the pitch angle to the elevator deflection which is just going to be delta theta over delta delta E. This would be 1 over S times delta Q over delta delta E. So basically, we can recycle the transfer function up above that relates Q to delta 
And if we just multiply it by a one over S, then we have the transfer function relating theta to delta E. So this is our model. It relates the pitch angle of the aircraft to the elevator deflection. All right, so we're gonna bring this into real life. We're gonna assign some numerical values to the transfer function, and we're gonna consider the business jet from the Nelson textbook. So it's like a small personal jet aircraft, all right? We're gonna assume that we're cruising at 40,000 feet with a velocity of 774 feet per second. And I think that's Mach 0.8 at that altitude. So 80% of the speed of sound. So I'm going to point out some aircraft mass and um, geometry, some of these stability derivatives, and then we're going to bring this into MATLAB. So we'll have a model in MATLAB that we're going to simulate. All right, so we have the plane form area, the mean chord. We have the weight. From the weight, you can get the mass in slugs. I know you guys love these uh, imperial units. They're everybody's favorite. We don't want SI units to take over the world. That's just absurd, right? Okay. So we have some of the geometry there. We have some non-dimensional stability derivatives. All of these are going to go into giving us the dimensional stability derivatives. And this is what our transfer function is made up of. All of these different terms. Okay. Part of why I'm putting all these here is um, if you want to go back and verify um, how these are calculated for different problems, it's just good to see. It's good to have an example of somebody plugging in the same numbers because, okay, it's funny. I've been trying to work out a couple different examples in the Nelson textbook as well as some other textbooks. And... Um, they don't show all the details of how they arrived at certain numbers. And I'm getting different numbers than they are for some examples. And so I'm spending a lot of time like going in circles trying to figure out if I made an error or if there's a typo in the textbook, which isn't uncommon, actually. Their textbooks have plenty of typos. And so anyways... I'm showing you all these numbers and how I got them so that if there's an error, maybe one of you guys will catch it. Um, or if you just want to see all the details of how we got to something, you can come back, take a peek. I think it's helpful. Okay, so assuming you plug all of the numbers in, this is going to be our transfer function. S minus 4.335. And we're going to bring this transfer function into MATLAB. Zero 09S squared, 5.559S. Okay, so you can see that from the denominator, the highest order of s is three that would mean that this is a third order transfer function i'll give you like a second to finish writing this and then we're going to go right over to matlab and define this transfer function okay Let's do this. Let's do this. Okay. So I'm going to define this transfer function. 
G theta delta. That's just how I do it in my code. Theta is the output, delta is the input. To make a transfer function in MATLAB, you use the command TF. And you use square brackets for the numerator of the transfer function and square brackets for the denominator of the transfer function. Now what you put in here is polynomial notation for the numerator and the denominator. So um, what is the numerator? It's negative 6.752 times S, so that goes first, and then minus 4.335 times S to the zero. So that's the numerator polynomial. And this is gonna run into my head, so I'm gonna move this down a couple lines. All right, then the denominator is s cubed, so we're gonna have one times s cubed plus 0 0.7509 times s squared plus 5.559 times s plus zero times s to the zero. All right, and actually, I'm just gonna run this code right now. And I'm going to show you what G theta delta looks like. Boom. You guys have probably made a transfer function in MATLAB before, but that's how you do it. All right. One more peek at there. Numerator, denominator, put in square brackets. All right, let's go back to the notes. Okay, so we built this transfer function in MATLAB. Now, we're gonna assume that we have a servo motor that's gonna be driving the elevator. And these are gonna have first order dynamics. There's some time delay whenever you wanna actuate a control surface on an aircraft. So we're gonna have this transfer function. All right, so the output of this transfer function is the elevator angle and the input is gonna be some control voltage. And we're gonna assume that di the dynamics are first order. So this is kind of like a generic first order system right here. And I'm gonna specify some numbers for this too. We're gonna to say this proportionality constant is one. This time constant, it's gonna be a quarter of a second which means the settling time, which is four times the time constant, is like one second. Okay, we'll bring this into MATLAB in a second, but let's, let's keep going here. We're going to have a... Um, let's introduce a feedback loop. This is going to be our, our control strategy. So whenever you build a feedback loop, on the left-hand side, what comes in is your reference or your desired dynamics. That's the input to your feedback loop. So we're gonna have some desired pitch angle for the aircraft. Maybe I want one degree. Then at the very end, the other side, is the actual pitch angle, the actual dynamics that we measure. Okay, so let's, let's throw in some transfer functions. That's what each of these blocks are for. So this transfer function takes in the elevator angle, outputs the pitch angle of the aircraft. Then we have our servo motor, which is gonna take the control voltage as an input, output the elevator angle. So the control voltage comes into here. Okay, this, this block is our controller right here. And we're gonna try a couple different controllers today. The King's Crown has a question. Sure, you can, you can ask your question. Oh, geez. I'm just gonna preemptively time you out, my friend. Because I just don't know where your uh where your question's gonna go okay um gotcha 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 all 
So, generic feedback loop here. First, let's consider what's called the open loop step response. Assuming that we're not using any controller. So I'm gonna show you what I mean here. This is like a, a simplification of the above diagram. And what I've done is I've eliminated the controller block. And this is called open loop, which means that the feedback loop, you don't see it down here anymore. It's been severed. So at this block over here, where the reference is coming in and being compared, we're just gonna have zero coming in here. There's no feedback. So what's gonna be coming out is gonna be delta theta ref. It's just gonna be the referent comes in, the reference comes in, we subtract zero. And this is gonna go into because we don't have our controller block here, we just have our servo motor that's actuating the elevator so we're just assuming that this raw difference is going in there and then obviously out of here comes the elevator angle it goes into our pitch dynamics here And what we're gonna do first is we're just going to take this open loop system with no controller and we're gonna specify a reference angle of one degree, which is pi over 180 radians. And we're just gonna see what happens. Okay. So a step reference pitch angle of one degree. Now, usually when we talk about a step, we mean this mathematical definition. So I have my reference pitch angle. It's gonna be zero for time less than zero. And then when time becomes greater than or equal to zero, I have just this discrete, boom. Now the reference is pi over 180 degrees. If you take the Laplace transform of this expression in the time domain, you're going to get pi over 180, which is the amplitude of the step, times 1 over s. All right, we're going to go back into MATLAB. We're going to simulate this open loop response. Prepare yourself. I'm having to do everything on the one computer today because MATLAB died on my desktop. I don't really know what happened there. Okay, let's, let's make the transfer function for that servo motor. So the output is the angle of the elevator and the input is that control voltage. So this was a first order transfer function. So we have numerator, denominator, and the numerator was just, there was a one on the top. And the denominator, it was 0 0.25 times S plus one. So there we go. Um, so what you can do, you can make a combined transfer function so the output will be theta, but the input is the control voltage. If I want this, it's gonna be um, this times G delta VC. So basically, if you have two blocks connected to each other in a block diagram, 
you can simplify that into a single block, which is just the product of the adjacent blocks. So what I mean is, we got these two that are feeding into each other. But what I could do is condense these into one block. And all that would be, it would, uh, so as the input, it takes the control voltage and now as the output, it's theta. And that's just the product of these two times G theta delta E. And we have delta theta ref coming in over here and coming out over here is delta theta. So I want to simulate the step reference, I mean the step response of this like open loop system. Can you do that for more than two transfer functions in a row? Yes. Like if I had, you know, like one, two, three, four, five, and they're all like connected in series like this, you can just multiply all of them together and that'll be the like combined transfer function. Okay. I know it blows, it blows the mind. Miracle says it seems like the rotation matrix math. Yeah, it's, it's pretty similar. Like, and, and that's why I, I tried to do like a similar kind of notation to the rotation matrices where it's like output and input. Um, I probably could have done different superscripts or something, cause this is different than what we did for the rotation matrices, but you're exactly right. It's the same kind of deal, Miracle. Okay. So we have this combined transfer uh, function. All right, let's get the step response. So we're going to use the step command. Now the output of the step command, you can do it a couple different ways, but um, you have the output and then you have time. This is what the step command can return to you. And what we're going to do is you do step of the transfer function that you want to feed a step input through. So I'm taking a step reference. I'm feeding it through this combined transfer function. And um, one note here, when you use the step command, it'll provide a unit step reference, which means the step will have an amplitude of one. However, uh, the step that I want to do has an amplitude of pi over 180. So how do I get this to do pi over 180 instead of one? Inside the step command, multiply by pi over 180. Boom. Um, okay, so we'll do that. And then what I want to do is plot it. T, theta, and um, I like to do like a thicker line. Let's turn on the grid. Let's label our axes. We're gonna have time in seconds. And our vertical axis is gonna be theta. Ooh, I wanna convert it to degrees. So in here, I'm simulating this in radians, but I can convert it to degrees when I plot it by multiplying by 180 over pi. Heck, let's even throw a title. Open loop step response with theta ref. Uh, 
one degree. All right, let's run it. Let's run the code. Ooh. Interesting. You can see a little squiggle up here. Let's zoom in. Okay, so what's going on here? I feed in this reference of pi over 180 radians for my pitch angle, meaning I want to go to one degree. And what does the open loop response do? So this is the actual pitch angle. It shoots through one degree, it oscillates, the oscillations die out, and then it just keeps pitching and uh, the pitch angle grows and grows and grows. So what does this look like? It looks like the aircraft, um, wait, so it's pitching down and uh, it just keeps going nose down. This plane is, is not in good shape. All right, let's talk about that for a second. Okay, here's, here's just a, a zoomed in portion here. Okay, so we can see that the pitch angle oscillates a little bit at first. You see some initial oscillations, but then it trends negative linearly over time. So eventually it just becomes this straight line where the pitch angle just continues to uh, it doesn't grow exponentially, but it just it continues to move in the same direction at the same rate. So when you see this happen, where it's not like exponentially decaying, but it's just like coasting off, that's indicative of marginal stability, which you've probably heard in a dynamic systems class. But what it means is the characteristic equation has a root with a real part equal to zero. So it has one or more roots on the imaginary axis. Okay, so let's let's uh, verify this marginal stability by looking at the system poles. Okay, let's go back to MATLAB. So you can simulate a system to like see what the response will look like, but we know that the characteristic equation tells us in advance what the response is going to look like. So check out this command, poll. And we're going to get the poles of that transfer function. Maybe we'll call it like my open loop poles. Oops. All right, let's run that. Okay, this pole, which has a zero real part, it exists on the imaginary axis. This is the pole that creates marginal stability and it makes our pitch angle just forever decline down and our plane crashes into the ground. These other poles are stable. Now, when I say poles, Poles are the same as roots of the characteristic equation. We just use the word poles for transfer functions. So all of these poles have negative real parts. They're stable. These two poles are responsible for the oscillations at the beginning because they are complex conjugate roots. All right. So the poles of the combined transfer function can be found using the poll command in MATLAB. That's what we just did. So this guy is responsible for marginal stability. Um, 
these poles are the short period mode. What does this pole belong to? The minus four. Where did that guy come from? Fugoid. No, no, no. Well, that's a good, that's a very good guess. But the fugoid, it has complex conjugate roots. Now, this model that we have, remember where it started? We took just the short period mode. So when you have longitudinal dynamics, you have um, the fugoid and you have the short period. We neglected the fugoid from the very beginning and we only kept the short period. All right. This guy is the servo motor. It has a time constant of a quarter of a second. The time constant is equal to minus one over the real part of the root. So if you take minus one over minus four, you get 0.25. All that to say, like when you combine transfer functions, the poles will be the, um, you, you just take the poles from the one and the other and you just add them to a list. So because we combined the servo motor with the short period, the combined system just has um, the poles from both. That's it. Okay, what we're gonna do now is we're gonna close the feedback loop. So we, we did a simulation where none of the feedback was allowed to come back in. So we're gonna do a feedback loop and we're gonna consider, um, we're gonna let the controller come back in. Now, if we're gonna talk about the closed loop response, we need to develop the closed loop transfer function. So what is the closed loop transfer function? Well, it's the transfer function that has an output delta theta, so over here on the right, and it has an input delta theta ref. All right. So let's, uh, let's derive this. And then we're going to go back into MATLAB and simulate the closed loop response. Okay, so this is going to be our closed loop transfer function. Its input is going to be theta ref. Its output is going to be theta. And that just means it's going to be delta theta over delta theta ref. All right, let's develop this transfer function. We'll do it in this way. Delta theta. And you can do this by just looking at the block diagram. Delta theta is G, it's this transfer function times the elevator input. But where does the elevator come from? It comes from this transfer function. So I have UB MAE student says, will you be uploading these filled out notes in the code after class? I'll definitely upload these notes. I might not upload the code. The reason I might not upload the code is because I want you to have to tappy tap tap it into your own computer. Actually, what I'll do, I'll put excerpts, excerpts of the code in the notes, but I won't like directly give you the MATLAB file. Okay. 
And then, where does the control voltage come from? Well, it comes from this transfer function. It takes the error in and then outputs the control voltage. So we're just, we're just going down the chain here. So VC is E. And, and this error is defined as delta theta ref minus delta theta. Because delta theta comes in here. So now I have this delta theta on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. Further, we're going to condense all three of these transfer functions and we'll call it G open loop of S. Okay. So if we bring... Well, okay, let's do it this way. G open loop times delta theta ref minus delta theta of S. Therefore, So we're very close to this closed loop transfer function here. So it's G open loop over one plus G open loop. All right. Now, before we bring this into MATLAB, we have to define um, a transfer function for our control block, which is the transfer function that takes in the error and outputs the voltage, right? So we're going to try two controllers today. And the first controller we're going to try is the simplest of simple controllers. It's called a proportional controller. Okay, so assuming that we use a proportional controller, our controller block is gonna be equal to just a constant, which I'll call K sub P, where P is for proportional. Now, you've probably heard of PID controllers. So the P in there is proportional the I is for integral, the D is for derivative, and a proportional controller just takes the P portion. It's the simplest controller there is. So KP is called the proportional gain. And for now, we're just gonna assume that KP equals one. Okay, so like just visualizing how this works, you're gonna input some reference pitch angle that you want the aircraft to go to. At this block, that reference is gonna be compared to the actual pitch angle, right? And then we're gonna, we're gonna get the difference between those two, that's the error. So a proportional controller just multiplies that error by a constant and the control voltage is just some constant times the error. In our case, the constant is one. Okay, so we're gonna assume that 
this is equal to kp which is just equal to one all right let's go back to matlab Okay, so we're gonna start a new segment here. Proportional controller, closed loop response. And our controller, um, it take, or its output is VC, its input is the error, and we're saying it's just equal to KP. So this is a proportional controller. And we also said KP is just one, it's re really simple proportional gain so the open loop transfer function we said was the product of all three of our transfer functions well we already multiplied two of them together so I can just recycle that Okay, now the closed loop transfer function, we just got an expression. Hey, what's up, Detox Mango? It's a funny name. <laughs> okay, so the closed loop transfer function is equal to the open loop transfer function divided by one plus the open loop transfer function. All right, let's run this code. Oh, it plots my figure again, that's cool. Now look at this. Don't freak out, but it made this huge transfer function that we, uh, we can't even fit on one screen. Now, um, Part of the problem here is when you just use that expression in MATLAB, it doesn't simplify this as much as it could. So let me show you how you simplify this a little bit. What you do is you say the closed loop transfer function should actually be equal to min real. All that means is the minimum realization and that's just fancy language for reduce this to the smallest order model it can be. So it, it cancels out anything that can be canceled. So let's run this. And we're gonna get something that's much more palatable. Okay, I'm gonna evaluate this. And now what does it look like? Okay, it, it at least fits on one screen. It's fourth order. Um, it is what it is. Most mechanical engineers know aerospace engineering. Um, I wouldn't necessarily I wouldn't necessarily say that, but they they have a lot of crossover. Okay. Okay, so th that's one way to get the closed loop transfer function. I'm going to show you the easiest way though. You just use the command feedback and you take as an argument the open loop transfer function and then you put a one next to it. Does min real work to simplify other polynomials or just transfer functions? Ooh, and uh, Srechtenwald has a similar question. What is the difference between min real and the simplify command? Let's see if we can use, um... okay, what I'm gonna do Let's start with this. So we'll make it like, okay, so it's back to this nasty thing. What if I say, will this work? Okay, simplify doesn't work for transfer function objects. It works for um, symbolic objects in MATLAB. So think of min real as like the simplify tool for transfer functions. Uh, does it work for other polynomials? I don't know if it'll do that 
for other polynomials, though. <laughs> okay. If you use the feedback command with a one, let's run it. This gives the same thing as the min real, except um, it kind of factored it differently. Like it has, instead of having a one in front of the uh, S to the fourth, it has like a quarter, but it's, it's equivalent. So whether you want to do like this formula, do the min real or just do feedback, probably do feedback because it's just one line. Okay, now that we have this feedback loop in place, I want to do the step response again. So how about we recycle some code from up above? And I'm gonna, I'm gonna recycle a couple of lines here. What does one represent in the feedback command? Oh, great question, great question. Okay, let me tell you what the one represents. Okay, this, this picture is getting ugly. I think I have another one of these up above. Okay. So in MATLAB, so we can condense all of these three into G open loop, right? Okay. Now, sometimes you have another block in the feedback loop and you could have some transfer function here like maybe like i'll just call it g of s whatever now the one or um or that second argument in the feedback command is this transfer function but because we put nothing in the feedback loop that's the same as having just a one here so when you do feedback, you put the transfer function in the top, which for us is just G open loop. And then you put the transfer function in the bottom, which is uh, just one. Detox has a few silly questions. Well, you can throw them in the chat and I may or may not answer them. <laughs> we can also talk after class too. Okay, so that's that's what the one is. Now, if you have a, some people might ask like, well, what, in what case do you have a transfer function within the feedback loop? This feedback loop represents um, a sensor measurement. So um, what you might do is maybe this signal is noisy and and actually it, it, it always will be what you might want to do is put a a filter in the lower feedback loop so that by the time you compare the pitch angle to the reference pitch angle it's like a clean filtered signal so it's pretty common to put a low pass filter down there to like clean it up a little bit Okay, let's go back to MATLAB. Detox Mango says, do mechanical and aerospace engineers at the graduate level learn quantum field theory? And can I learn this stuff by starting with papers? Some people in materials engineering learn quantum theory. Um, I think it's more popular in physics though. Can you learn it from papers? Papers are usually more advanced in their language. I would go to a textbook or honestly, YouTube. YouTube is such a great resource as a starting point for many things. Okay, so we're gonna, we're recycling some of this step response code. G open loop. Wait, what did I just, did I just overlap? Oh, I pasted this into place that I did not want to. Okay. 
I do watch a lot of YouTube. Okay, then you're you're on your way. <laughs> a little too much YouTube, don't we? Don't we all though? Okay, so we have our closed loop transfer function. Remember my step, I want to do one degree, so I, I multiply by pi over 180. Um, I'm just going to change some of the title here for aesthetic purposes. Closed loop step response, we're using a proportional controller. And, and after we do this, we're also going to get the poles of this. G closed loop. Now you might be surprised by what's about to happen here. We put a feedback loop on this and look what happens to the response. I want my aircraft pitch angle to go to one degree, right? And what's happening with the feedback loop is um, there's some error it gets compared. I, I mean, the error goes through the proportional controller and boom, it goes unstable. Wait, wait, wait. What if I try, I want to try something here. I didn't think of this until right now. Uh, what if... What if we make the gain minus one? What if we make the gain minus one? And let's rerun this segment of code. Still, still unstable. Look at this. Your, your aircraft is going out of control and look at this it's 10 to the 24th so like basically this the aircraft's doing this and it's like you guys you're you're dead it's game over um let's let's change it back to one real quick so we can explain this with the closed loop poles here Why did I make such a long variable name? It's this guy. This closed loop pole has a positive real part. And this is what's making us unstable. Now, the reason I'm showing you this is um, often when we think of feedback controls, wait, what did, okay, Srechtenwald says, what did we effectively just do by changing the gain to minus one. Okay, so, I mean, at the most basic level, this block, we're just multiplying the error by plus or minus one. Um, If, let's say the error is positive, that means that this angle is bigger than the actual angle. So maybe I want, so I want it to go to one degree, but let's say that I measure half a degree. So what I need to do is, in terms of the elevator, Okay, what, what I think is happening is that when the gain is plus one, it sends the elevator in the opposite direction than where it should actually go. So, I mean, the elevator eventually it wants to pitch the aircraft nose down or nose up. And I'm just suspecting if we make it plus one, it's going the wrong way. I'm just, so if we do minus one, it's sending the elevator in the correct 
direction to send the nose in the correct direction. However, I think it's too aggressive. So that it, it just keeps um, making overcorrections. And I don't think you can... So, I mean, by that logic, you might think, oh, well, let's make the correction smaller. So, like, maybe if I just make it negative but minus 0 0.001, I think it'll still go unstable. But at a, at a slower rate. Let's see. Wait! Wait a second. Okay, what are our poles? Wait, we're all stable. Okay, what if we what if we pump this up a little bit? Good gravy. I thought for sure this was going to be unstable for all gains. Okay, wait. Let's make the root locus. This is off the cuff, guys. I'm surprised by what happened. I didn't... I didn't... Because I thought I made the root locus earlier, and I thought it wasn't possible. Oh, but it was because I had the wrong sign. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. Hold on. So what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. Our locus. But we're going to do the negative of this. We can't spend too much time on this, but. Okay, let's try this. Yeah, this is what confused me. Okay, look look at this. Look at this. Wait, I got to zoom in here. What's going on with this? Okay, this should be showing how the closed loop poles change as I increase that um, proportional gain K. Now, um, this is why it doesn't make sense to me because this is saying that one of our closed loop poles, it just becomes unstable as I increase the gain. KP. Oh, okay, okay, I see, I see. Um, no, I need to, I need to do this. I need this transfer function. Okay, we won't spend too much more time on this. I think I have to put the negative of this. Let's try this. Oh. Okay, let's do a little optimization here. Okay, what is the root locus? This shows you where our roots for the closed loop system will go as we 
change that parameter k now the fastest possible settling time for this system is when we move all of our closed loop poles as far to the left as we can so let's these guys so as i increase k these roots move to the right and that means they're getting slower but this route moves to the left, means meaning it's getting faster. So the fastest configuration is somewhere in between, and let's try to find it. Is this like... Gain 0.368. Hmm. Okay, hold on, hold on, sorry. What is this one? 0.368. All right, let's... We'll just try this. We'll try point two as a gain. Point two two. And the settling time, what'll it be? Pretty quick. Ooh, but it's ugly. Imagine being in this aircraft. Every time you want to go to one degree of pitch, it's just like, woo. -hoo -hoo -hoo. Okay. Let's go back to the notes. Let's talk about that for a second. Would that be noticeable though? I think so, Miracle. I think it would be. Like, one degree of pitch. It's changing by tenths of a degree. But, well, one thing to think about is how, uh, so we're, we're pitching about the CG, right? Depending on how long the aircraft is, how how far you are from that pivot point, you're actually going to be like moving a, a fair amount. Um, and it's and it's like kind of fast. I I have a feeling you would. I think you would feel that. Okay, so keep in mind this figure was before we changed around the sign of that proportional gain. And in this case, it's going unstable. Um, that's on me. I had the sign going the wrong way. So it, in that case, we had this positive real part of a pole unstable. Now, from what we just did, here's some something important to recognize. When doing proportional control, um, number one, check the sign. Okay, but number two. Typically, increasing the gain too much makes the system unstable.
And the only way to find what a proper gain is, is uh, using the root locus. Okay, I want to show you another popular type of controller with the time we have left. Now there's there's like PI, PID, and whatever, but this is a controller that I really like, a lead compensator. This is what it looks like. It's a transfer function that has a proportional part, and then it multiplies a transfer function that looks like this. When you say it's proportional control, what exactly are we comparing the proportions of? Well, they call it a they call it proportional control because the error signal is multiplied by a constant to produce the control signal, which in our case is a control voltage. So, the control voltage is proportional at all times to the error. And the proportionality constant is that gain. So it's the proportions of the control signal to the error signal. Um, so this, this is what a lead compensator looks like. It has one zero and one pole and one gain term. And uh, depending on the relative magnitude of these terms, like if the magnitude of beta is greater than the magnitude of alpha, we call it a lead compensator. But if, if those are switched, like if alpha is smaller than beta, we call it a lag compensator. Okay, we won't get too much into why it's called lead and lag, but I wanna point out a, uh, a cool feature. Um, when you design a lead or lag compensator, you get to choose where you would like to place a pair of closed loop poles. Um, now, that's, that's two poles, a pair. This system that we're looking at, it has um, four or five closed loop poles. I think when we use this controller, it's gonna have five closed loop poles. Um, so the, the caveat, it, it doesn't give you direct control over all of the closed loop poles, just a pair. So it, probably starting Wednesday, we're gonna start getting into what's called state feedback control. State feedback control lets you choose every single closed loop pole, which is, um, very important that's why it, it's like a preferred controls technique because it gives you more uh precise control over every closed loop pole this one is kind of like a crap shoot <laughs> uh, you have to iterate a lot to find something that you like now so so we're going to design one actually i'm, I'm just going to give you one but i'll give you like the basics of how i got it so I want to choose a pair of poles with a settling time of five seconds and a pursuit, a percent, percent overshoot of 10%. So overshoot is if I want to go to one degree, I expect my controller to overshoot that by like um, a 10% margin, but then come back down. So, okay, we're just going to derive these. So overshoot is related to the damping ratio of a system. So here's the formula. Your damping ratio is the square root of the natural log of the overshoot, that whole quantity squared. So if I have 10% overshoot, we have this variable, which I'm just calling OS. You set that equal to 0.1. You just convert it to like a ratio form. Okay, so this is the square root of that divided by the natural log of the overshoot squared plus pi squared. So if you plug in 0 0.1 in there, in there, 
the damping ratio you need for 10% overshoot is 0 0.5912. So it's just using that formula. Now to, to prescribe some poles, we're also gonna need the natural frequency. So I said the saddling time, I want that to be um, five seconds. The settling time is equal to four divided by the damping ratio times the natural frequency. And we just got the damping ratio. So I can solve for the natural frequency. It's four over the damping ratio times the settling time, which is five seconds. And so we get this for our natural frequency. 1.353 radians per second. All right, so we have the natural frequency, we, we have the damping ratio. So our desired closed loop poles, let's call it S star. This is like a common variable for desired poles. This is the standard notation for a pair of complex conjugate roots. Right? And if you plug in the numbers we have above, we have this. Minus 0 0.8 plus or minus 1.8. 0915i. So if I can get my closed loop poles to be here, I'm going to have that settling time of five seconds, that overshoot of 10%. All right. So I'm just going to jump to the result here. A lead compensator that can produce these poles well if you take digital controls we'll learn all about this but you use uh, the root locus magnitude and angle criterion and these are the numbers you get so for the gain you need 0 0.5046 for the alpha term you need minus 0.25 for the beta you need 0 0.6286. So um, let's plug this into MATLAB. Okay, here's our lead compensator. I'll call it G lead. It's gonna be transfer function. Actually, you could put the gain outside, 5046. Doesn't really matter. And we have S minus 0 0.25. S plus 0 0.6826. Okay, so in this case, our open loop transfer function is this theta to the control voltage times G lead. In my closed loop transfer function, we can just use the feedback command, G open loop, and then you put a one. Let's do that. And let's also get the poles of this. Wait, hold on a second here. These are not the poles I wanted. Uh, 
Wait, hold on. We do this, right? Theta VC times this, right? I think that should work. Wait, what did I do wrong here? Wait, because I did this earlier. And these were the desired poles, like this minus 0.8 thing, right? Did you mean to change your gain back to 1? Oh, I see. But but that gain, this gain doesn't go into this one because I I'm totally like bypassing. I'm using a totally different controller, so I'm not recycling any of that. Um, it's point six two eight six. Oh, thank you. Let's see. Okay, six two. Oh, thank you. Uh, wait, let's try it. Please. Wait, is this what I wanted? Okay, th that's really close. That's really, <laughs> that's really close. Remember our desired poles, what were they? Minus 0.8 plus or minus 1.091 or something. So um, that's just, I, I made a rounding error in the code or something, but you can see that the compensator, there's five closed loop poles, but at least two of them you can specify. The other three, you kind of don't know what's gonna happen. And for that reason, you end up like iterating a couple times um, because there's different combinations of alpha and beta that can give you these desired poles, but the, the other ones like change. So there's actually many combinations that give you an unstable system. And this is just a stable one that I found. Okay, we'll quickly look at the step response of this because I know we're running over time. Um, so I, I point out here a little something that um, there's something called dominant roots. The dominant roots are, of a system are the slowest ones. They bottleneck your whole performance. So if I wanted my overall sy system settling time to be five seconds um, by this like minus 0.8 condition, these two right here they have a smaller real part, so they're slower. And so my overall system settling time will be slower than the five seconds that I specified. But at least the system is stable. Okay, instead of, I'll, I'll just show you the result from MATLAB. You do the step response just like we did for the other system. But this is interesting. Oops. So um, it does go to the desired reference of one degree, but look at this. There's this massive undershoot. So in this case, if I want to go to one degree, this aircraft is actually going to dip and then go up. I don't think that would be the most desirable um, 
kind of performance. The overshoot at the top, if you like really zoom in here, there's like a really small overshoot. I think it's even smaller than the 10% that I was looking for. And uh, the system settling time to when it gets like within plus or minus 2% of the final value, I don't know, maybe just visually, it looks like around seven seconds. But remember, I wanted five seconds. Why is this slower than what I wanted? Because of these nasty, dominant closed loop poles that I didn't even want. Where does undershoot come from? Um, this comes from the zeros of the open loop system. It's weird because like, you know, poles determine settling time. Uh, they determine stability. Zeros determine um, weird behavior like undershoot. It has nothing to do with stability, but it's still like a, a weird transient behavior. Okay, I think I had just a couple comments and then we're then we're done with this. Um, so the types of control methods we were looking at today are transfer function methods. It's also called like um, traditional control systems techniques or classical. Um, these kinds of techniques are very effective for designing control or uh, control systems for low order systems. I'm talking like first or second order systems. So you start getting into third, fourth order, it's gonna be a nightmare. Uh, so they become more difficult to use as the system order increases. Or if you have multiple inputs, multiple outputs to your system, we call those MIMO, <laughs> MIMO systems. You do not wanna use transfer function techniques. So what's more popular um, are state feedback methods. These are also called modern control system techniques and they're preferred. They're, those techniques are much easier to automate. Um, much easier to work with. So we're gonna get into that. Um, these notes, I'm gonna go back, I'm gonna clean this up. Um, I'll post these. I'm glad we pointed out the problem with this, this gain here. I wanna take a deeper look at that. Uh, so thank you very much, guys, I appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed this uh, little crash course in uh, some classical controls techniques. We don't have a lot of time to spend on controls. I wish we could do more. So we're kind of just blasting through some examples that, that show a lot of different stuff. When you get a chance, can you post the past notes? Yeah, I know, I got a little behind on those. I'll definitely put those up. Yeah, we're like six behind. Yeah, I, I know. Um, I got a little behind on those. I'll put those up. I'll put those up. Um, ooh, it's 4.30. We actually have Discord office hours right now. I'm going to head over to those. If you guys have questions on the homework, you can pop over and join me. What's the name of this song? Let me show you. Oh, clever. It's called Keys and Thank You by Fairlight. I'll throw it in the chat. I dig it.
You're welcome, Dilly. Crispy Brownies, just a quick question for the homework. Is a settling time of 150 plus seconds normal for a fugoid mode? Yeah. I think the... Um, take a Boeing 747. The fugoid mode settling time is like two minutes, I'm pretty sure. Short period mode. Something like 10 seconds. Dilly says, <laughs> I've been hearing it all semester and it slaps. Straight slapping, man. Um, yeah. No, that sounds reasonable for a few good. All right, my friends. Peace. Enjoy the rest of your Monday. If you have homework questions, jump on over to Discord. What are you waiting for? Hey, you're welcome. You're welcome. You can always catch up on the videos. See you Wednesday. Adios, my friends.